Well, good morning. I'm Keith Mathis, and uh, Pastor Jared asked me to preach this morning. So if you're visiting, you probably have caught on that uh, our pastor is in Peru. So this morning, if you like my sermon, my name is Keith Mathis. If you don't like my sermon, my name is Jim Shirley. So <laughs> just in case we have problems today, all right? So if you have your Bibles this morning, why don't you open them to the book of James, James chapter 4. We're going to do a deep dive into a topic that I think we need as Christians, which focuses on understanding and discovering God's will. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you open them to James chapter 4. We're going to be looking at chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. Well... Pastor Jared makes a stand. I don't want to be in trouble, so you better stand with me as we get ready to read it, okay? So in James chapter 4, verse 13, he said, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor and appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Now, one of the things this morning, thank you, you can be seated this morning. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for your word and that you tell us exactly that we need to be looking and seeking your will more than anyone else's. Father, help us in this message today to leave with a nugget that helps us be willing to put you first in these areas. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now in James chapter 4, a couple of things that I wanted us to start off with as we start thinking about the will of God, okay? As a Christian, first off, if you're lost this morning, this message is really not for you. I'm going from the direction of a Christian, I'm going from the direction of us trying to be right with God and walk with God and know God's will in everything that we do. When I first got saved, this was one of the biggest struggles I had, is how do you know the will of God in your life? And so in talking to to Christians who had walked with him for a while, they would come back and make several statements of, well, you pray and you read your Bible. And I was doing all of that, like many of you probably have done too, but the point was there was still something missing there in understanding God's will. And then all of a sudden, after discipleship and walking with God a few years, the connection started coming there. As you look at this particular passage this morning, many people struggle with understanding what the will of God is. And so my first question to you this morning would be, do you even know the will of God? Do you even care to know the will of God? We kind of have gotten to a point in our culture to where we are kind of going through culture with this attitude of, I'm saved... And now that I'm saved, anything I want to do or anything I think or anything I choose to to do or any decision I make, God just has to bless it and approve it because I am who I am. I'm a child of God. And yet so much of that is is wrong theologically. So this morning in James, James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the one who's writing about the will of God, which I think is an interesting point. James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the one who's saying that many people are making decisions that are not in alignment with what God wants for their life. So I want to throw a couple of ideas at you this morning. So do you know the will of God? Are you following God's will? Do you want God's will in everything that you do? So this morning as we start off, I want to show you three slides, okay? This is going to kind of get you to the end just in case I botch it this morning and you don't understand where I'm going, okay? So let me show you three graphics, okay? So these guys will help me with our first graphic. Go ahead and go to the graphics and we'll come back. Okay, so this first graphic. You and I as a Christian, God starts off with us as a Christian, and we go on the Christian growth, okay? And what you'll notice here is that God uses a lot of different things to show us the will of God. And I'm going to talk about those in a moment, but he shows us a lot of things, including circumstances that we go through. But God's ultimate purpose in everything, as you look here, is to get us to the point where we are fulfilling God's vision, and we're doing exactly what God wants. Not kind of what God wants, exactly what God wants for you, you. And so we're going to talk about that real specific. Let's see the second slide. As we look at this, 
we look at the process of, God, of understanding God's will. Many people think, well, God's will has to be something, something just huge and enormous and, and all of this kind of stuff. God's will can be a quiet, quiet voice speaking to you and asking you to do something. So one of the things I did, I put this process together because I tried to think of, well, how does God speak to me in so many cases, okay? So God directs, and then our action or behavior has to kind of follow that. A lot of times there's a crisis or an event. I want to talk about crisis or event because God does that in so many of our lives. He will allow a crisis or event to give us and cause us to have new direction. That crisis of our event, we go through it, and a lot of times we miss that God is actually in the midst of the whole deal. And we get on the other side and we look back and we go, wow, guess what? God was in the middle of that thing the whole time. And we'll say, wasn't that a heck of a... Look at those circumstances. Wasn't that something? Wasn't that a coincidence? A coincidence ought to be the biggest sin in a Christian's mouth because there are no coincidences with God. God knows exactly what's happening. God doesn't get up and say, wow, did you know that Mathis fell on the slip and slide and ripped his legs? Can you believe that? I don't think that surprised God at all. So the point is there's a crisis. Then next, seeking and focus. After we go through a crisis, a lot of times that's when we come back and we kind of seek God because we're so miserable. We're such in turmoil. And then what happens? There's a new direction for us personally. It could be a new job. It could be a new direction. It could be a new ministry or whatever it is. And then what is the last? There's insights then God allows us to have for his will. And so what happens is we start catching on. God is moving in my life. I didn't see it at first, but I can see it on the back end. So that's where we're going today, okay? All right, let's go to our first thing that we want to look at this morning. Just a couple of things to, to suggest to you. In our country... Do you know there's 2,300 different types of jobs somebody can have? I'm sorry, 23,000. Did I say 2,300? 23,000 types of jobs. The odds of a kid, one of our kids graduating from college and getting the right job, do you realize how minimal the possibility is with 23,000 types of jobs? And so when we think about trying to understand God's will, we get into that same, same idea when we think about trying to understand God's will. And so let me name a couple of things that people are doing right now, okay? Many people are playing the Bible roulette kind of deal. They're jumping in their Bible, they're reading two verses, boom, that's God's will. Or they're doing the finger pointing deal. You've seen that, they flop the Bible open and point to a verse and that must be God's will. None of those are biblical and none of those are theologically sound. Then we've got the fleecers. I don't know if you've ever laid out a fleece. Fleecers, they're always looking for a sign. They're always looking for something. They're laying out a fleece over everything. The problem with that is that you'll say, well, that's biblical. Well, it was biblical for one person to lay out a fleece. I don't know about your fleece. And some of our fleeces, we don't do it that same way either. Then we've got the people who are caught up into other things, such as the visions and the out-of-body experiences. And God gave them a dream. And so since God gave them a dream while they were sleeping, it must be God's will. Well, there are some of those in the Bible. I'm not convinced everybody who has a dream right now is God's will. But the point is we have all these people who are trying for all this other stuff. And do you realize that God is not trying to hide his will from you at all? He's not waiting for you to sleep. He's not waiting for you to read the tea leaves or any of those kind of things to find out his will. So let's look at some things. Number one, if you have your Bible, we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. First thing I want you to see this morning is ignoring God's will. And this is where I think some of our churches are this morning. We've ignored God's will because what we have done is that we have looked at this and we have decided that, you know what, my will is the big deal. God's will is secondary. And so in James chapter 4, verse 13, look what he says. Come, you who say today or tomorrow, you will go to such and such a city and will spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Now, we've read that many times, but many people ignore the will of God. And what do they do? Well, some of that is because of the complexity of life. In verse 13, he tells the people to come and start examining some things. Our life is complex. Yours is too. And so we have that complexity of life that we look at. And one of those, as we do this, focuses on this issue of how long we're going to live and how long, how long we're going to walk with God. And so we learn that we are, life is a vapor. Now let me tell you something. 66 years old, I had a birthday this week, thank you. And uh, so 66 years old, life is more of a vapor for me than it is some of you in this room. Would you agree with that, amen? 
And we look at life and we say it's a vapor, but you know what? It feels like a, really a vapor as you get older. It goes faster. It goes by quicker. Some of you are saying, man, it's in just a six months, Christmas will be here again. And you're right, it will be here just like that. And so life is a vapor. And so that word there that we look at as vapor, when we start talking about that, that tells us that, it, it, that it's just taking us on beyond, uh, and it's going and eating up so fast. So the complexity of life. In Proverbs, Proverbs 27.1 tells us not to boast about tomorrow. It says you do not know what tomorrow will bring. And that's exactly what we're getting into with the things of God. I don't know what tomorrow will bring, but many times we spend all of our time talking and focusing about tomorrow. What are we going to do tomorrow? What are we going to do next year? Now, the Bible's not anti-planning. It's not that. It's not anti-making uh, preparation. Some of you ha have retirement. You're putting money in retirement. None of that's wrong. But the point is, is that when we're living more for tomorrow than we are for today, there's going to be a problem with that. Because God's trying to live with us and walk with us and all today is what he's trying to do. So do you run things by your calendar and do you have, does everything bridge on that calendar to where everything you're looking at is for next week and for the week after? What about today? What is God doing today? This is Father's Day. What are you doing today with your father or your, 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 the gentleman who is that father figure in your life? We can get so focused about next week that we don't live for what we're needing to do today. A second part of this is that uncertainty of life. Life is uncertain, 14 tells us, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You're just a vapor. It's a vapor appears for a little while and then vanishes. So what will life bring? How do you handle the future? There will be a day, and this is hard to comprehend, there's going to be a day that, guess what? As much as we hate funerals, they're going to have your funeral one day. Isn't that gross? Isn't that gross? Unless Jesus raptures us out, and that's what I'm banking on, amen? Then he's good. we're going to have a funeral for you one day. And that is just one of the weirdest things to think about. And, of course, it's gotten weirder as I've gotten older, too. You know why? Because time is getting less and less. And so when we talk about life being a vapor, that means what are you going to do with your life from this point forward? And so it's easy for you to think, well, you know, that's not a big deal for me because I've got so long to live. I've got this. I've got so much more life. Let me tell you something. There's a group of senior adults here. Let me just tell you ahead of time. They were all cool and young at one time. They were all cool and young at one time. Well, most of them were. Most of them were. But they started getting old and aging. And guess what? You're going to get old and age too. Your stuff's going to droop and drop too. Don't you kid around. Your stuff's going to droop and drop. You're not going to be any different than anybody else. Because you know what? We, that's ahead of us. That's part of it. And some of it is awesome. And then some of it is you start realizing, what am I doing for God? What, is God, what am I doing in trusting God with my life in all of this? So that briefness of life, the word vapor, you know what the word vapor really means? Mist. Your life is a mist. I put some cologne on this morning and it, 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 it tells me on the packaging, it, gave, it does it as a mist. And so I had to go to Wanda. I said, can you smell me? And she said, why? I said, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the mist on whether I had cologne on. And so she smelled at me, and she said, she said, well, I'm not smelling real good this morning. I'm thinking, well, great, you know? So, so I'm supposed to have cologne on just in case you get close to me. So, uh, but it was a mist. And so what happened with that mist? It's so faint, that it, but it attaches to, uh, to everything that goes around. But it's very faint, isn't it? So everything about this goes in that direction. So we look at the briefness of life. And then let's look at one other piece of this little piece here, the frailty of life. Verse 16. Notice what he said, boast. The word boast I thought was an interesting term. The boasting he's talking about in verse 16, notice in verse 16, what did he say? But as it is, you boast in your, in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. What's he talking about? He's not talking about being positive. He's not talking about uh, confidence, good pride to where, hey, we know what we're doing and we are an expert in this area. No, he's not talking about that. You know what he's talking about? Vain, prideful boasting. It's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. And you'll meet people who they are so caught up into that. It's all about them. Our churches today have become such a consumer personality that what happens is it's hard to get younger people to come to church anymore because they're looking to see what does that church bring to me? 
What does that church deliver for me and my family? And so if that church doesn't do it, they're willing to go someplace else. It's that consumer mindset. And you know what? There's a certain amount of truth to that because the church wants to meet, meet people for the ministry purposes. But the inside of that is that part of it, where is the ministry side of that? And we miss it so many times. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's look at our second point this morning. Second thing that we need to see is disobeying God's will. God's shown you maybe something, verse 17. Verse 17 says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is what? What's that next word? Sin. To him it is sin. So God's shown us what to do, but we decided we don't like that. We vote no. I'm not doing it. So what happens? God says, it's sin in your life to do something like that. Because who are we supposed to be serving in the first place? What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be serving God, walking with God in everything that he wants for us. But we said, no, I don't like what God wants me to do. I'm not doing it. That's what, is, what the reference here, disobeying God's will. And so one part of that is, that is the word pride. Pride is a horrible deal. Pride is an excessive preoccupation with self and one's own importance, achievements, status, possessions, this sin is considered rebellion against God. Why? Because it's all about, once again, our unholy trinity. What was our unholy trinity? Me, myself, and I. It's all about me. And so that's, that's what God is fighting against here. And so what do we do? We ignore God's will. A second thing about this is an ignorance. Now, the ignorance that I want to talk about is he talks about the right thing. Notice in that verse, he said, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing. Thing. In the Greek, this comes from a Greek word called kalos, which means beautiful, good. The Greeks looked at this as everything which brings excellence. To him that, that, that to him, let me go back to my passage, to, therefore, to the one who knows the right thing. What's the right thing? It's the excellent thing. What's the excellent thing? Is it me, myself, and I, and what I want to do? Of course not. The excellent thing is being submissive to God, doing what God's called us to do. Wanting to follow God in all direction. But once again, here's what we have done in our American culture. We have compartmentalized church and the Holy Spirit and God. We've got our church box, and we can talk all the church jargon, and we can go through the motions, and then we've got our job box over here, and we can separate our job over here, and we've got our family thing over here. And do you realize that God does not want us to compartmentalize anything? God wants all of it flowing together. He wants us to be a witness on the job. He wants us to be a witness in our family. All of those. So he talks about ignorance. And then he said, to him that knows to do it right, do the right thing, and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. That word sin there actually focuses on the Greek word harmatia, which means sin and failure. Sin by choice. It's one thing to fall into sin. It's sin. But it's one thing to stumble into it. Whole different deal to do it by choice. Do you realize the difference between murder, first degree premeditated murder, and second degree murder? You know the difference? It was choice. You planned and chose to kill that person. Nine times out of ten, the punishment's always going to be harsh. Why? Because it was premeditated. This is what we're talking about with God. It was premeditated. We chose not to, be, not to, to just sin, or we didn't just sin. We chose not to follow God and to sin. It was looked at as being mightier in that area. And then what happens is, some of this is we just close our eyes to some things. Let me give you an example. Moses was a phenomenal leader. Everybody's heard of Moses. He led children of Israel out of Egypt. What if, what if Moses said, I don't like that job? I'm not doing it. He was living in luxury. He was living in the palace. He was, you know, he was a stepson of the Pharaoh. He was living there when God called him. I don't like that job. It's not prestigious enough. And he decided to stay in the palace. Now, he could have gone up through the ranks, maybe even become Pharaoh one day. And how does God measure Moses' life as Pharaoh? It's nothing. It's worthless. It's choice, sin by choice, because God said, you're going to lead the children of Israel out of, out of Egypt. Moses said, I'm going to be Pharaoh one day, sin by choice. God has actions he wants us to do. God has things he wants us to do. And sometimes we have said no. You say, well, wait a second. You don't understand it. You don't understand what's happened in my life. You don't understand God has failed me. God did not do what I wanted. I've had somebody die that I love. I had somebody who I, who I care about, and they got hurt, and they went through tough times. Yeah, all that's true. But we've come to a place where we try to treat God like he's some kind of spiritual Santa Claus, and we've missed it. 
Because that spiritual Santa Claus mindset makes us think that God is to beckon to our call about everything. And we've missed it. Because God is not worshiping us, we've got this thing backwards. God is not here to worship us. We're here to worship Him. We're here to see what He wants to do. We're here to find out His will. We're here to listen to Him. Praise God we've got a pastor who preaches God's Word to us. You know, there's a lot of churches that don't have that. I think about, about, uh, about this idea of uh, ignoring God's will. I mean, I've ignored God's will. I got mad years ago, threw my Bible in a box and said, forget it. God did not perform the way I thought he was going to perform. And for five years, walked away from God, lived like a lost person. Lived like a lost person. When Wanda and I got together, I was backslid. Got active into a church, and I'm, I was not happy about going back to church. I was angry about stuff. And so we got active in church, and the pastor married us, and Wanda says, well, we need to get more active. So she starts to sell me one Sunday driving home. She's going to teach the, the, youth, uh, the youth girls. And I'm saying, oh, man, don't do that. They're going to expect us to be here all the time. <laughs> I wish that was a lie, but it wasn't. And so I, she's doing, she did what God told her to do, and I was griping the whole time. So we went for some time. And so uh, for me, uh, I just was angry. And so I kind of went kicking and screaming. And so, you know, we have that with guys a lot of times. And one day we were driving home from lunch, and they were, at, they were rewriting their Constitution bylaws. And so they stood up and they said, look, we, are, we don't know how to do this. Will anybody help us from the church? If you'll be, serve on this team, just help us. And so they asked for this Sunday after Sunday. And so uh, one Sunday we're driving home. Wanda said, hold on just a second. She said, y'all be ashamed of yourself. And I said, why? She said, you can write that constitution and bylaws in your sleep. And they need help, and you need to help them. And I, was, I don't care. I'm just, I'm just mad. And all of a sudden, that week, man, God just started talking to me. So I went back and joined, joined the team, you know. And so, because you got God, the Holy Spirit, and then you got the Holy Spirit, Wanda, you know. So you got both. <laughs> And so I say that to say God does that with our spouses sometimes. And that's where God starts softening everything. And what's so wild about this little old church, you know, this is a church in Chesterfield, Missouri. And so we're going. And so uh, we start going. And so, I don't know, a year or so later, uh, the pastor had a problem with the church. And they end, he ended up leaving. So they had guest speakers come in. They had uh, an interim pastor come in. And he came in. And so anyway, one Sunday, somebody didn't show. And so they said, do you mind speaking? We don't have somebody speaking. So this is several years after this. And so I look at that, and I, so I got up and spoke one Sunday, cause I'm, just to fill in, because so, everybody was coming to church. And that turned into seven months with that, them not having a pastor and helping pull the church together and help them get a pastor. And we raised $70,000 and paid the building off so the pastor wouldn't, have any, any, wouldn't owe anything on the building. And so, it, so we did all that. And so I look at that, you look back and you think, was that a coincidence? Let me ask you, was that a coincidence? No. God's, God's willing to set the circumstances up to bring us to a point to break us, to get us to be submissive to him. Now let's look at our third and last point this morning, okay? Now you're ready to obey the will of God. Why? Because now you're listening. You're listening. In verse 15, he said, in 4 or 15, he said, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. Now, it's not, there's nothing magical in those words. You hear people say, well, then when they pray, God, if it's your will, that's a bunch of fooey sometimes. There's nothing magical in those words. God's looking at the heart. Are we looking at the, are we, is our heart at a place where we're saying, God, I want your will. What's your will about this job? What's your will about wanting me to do this? What's your will about this career? God is looking at the heart. In Acts chapter 22, verse 14, it said, and, God's, and he said, the God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see righteous ones and to hear an utterance from his mouth. God's not trying to hide his will from us, but he is trying to get us in position so we're ready to hear it. And sometimes that takes a little while. Chuck Swindoll had a listing I thought was great about prerequisites if you want to know God's will. Let me give you these five real quick. Chuck Swindoll said, first off, you've got to be a Christian. If you want to know God's will, you've got to be a Christian. And you know that I absolutely agree with that. Why is God going to show you his will if you're lost? 
The first thing that we're supposed to do is get saved. Secondly, you must be seeking God's wisdom. God, what do you want me to do? Third, you must really want to do God's will. Meaning when God says it, you're willing to say yes. Fourth, you must be willing to pray and wait. Because guess what? God is not always on our timetable. Amen? He's not on our timetable. He is not flipping out over the time. And sometimes God's waiting for us and to change so that he can do something. And then last, you must be willing to give up your comfort. And that's, what, that's where we're, here in our country, we don't want to do that. We don't want to give up our comfort. God, I want to serve you, but here's the deal. Don't you ask me to take a job that's going to pay less than $120,000 a year because you know that's what I've got right now. So God, I'll follow you anywhere for $140,000. <laughs> I wish that was a joke, don't you? But you know I'm telling the truth. God... Look what God has blessed me with. What if God only pays you 60 and tells you to do it? Look what God has blessed you with. But that's not how we look at it. We look at it always bigger and better. And I wish it didn't go into the pastor ranks like this, but sometimes pastors are no better than anybody else. Isn't it amazing sometimes that pastors always leave for bigger churches? What's the odds of that? Always leave for bigger churches. You just, uh, you just hardly ever see a pastor who goes to a smaller church. A second part of this is understanding his will. Ephesians 5.17 tells us how to understand it. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So how does God lead us then? How do we get through this superficial world that we're in with all of this? First off, he reads us through the Bible. He leads us through the Bible. If we're not in the Word, then how can He even give us any guidance? It's going to be through the Bible where He, where he taps into that sensitivity on us. A second part of this is through the Holy Spirit. God starts speaking to us through the Holy Spirit to see how do we respond. Are we open to, to what He's asking us to do? Also through counsel of other people. And if you're married, it's going to be through your spouse. We helped a little church there in Chesterfield. Not, not a coincidence. God used it to bring me back. God used it to pay their church off and call a buddy of mine there, and he's been there 25 years, 27 years, whatever it is. And he's been their pastor. And so went to a conference two weeks ago and didn't know he was going to do this, and so he calls me up at the conference and thanked me for helping get the church back together. Him and the elders came and thanked me publicly and then turned around and he said, I'm, I'm, the reason I'm here is because God used this man to bring me here, talking about me. And so he's still their pastor right now. They've built a big, beautiful auditorium. I didn't know he was going to do all that stuff. I would have dressed better if I had known that. I, I didn't know he was going to do that. But you know what I'm talking about. You say, you say what, that wasn't a coincidence. God led us to a little church over in, over in St. Charles right after that to help them get going. So we were there a year and a half, help them get going. And then God led us to help a church get started in Eureka, Missouri. And so I, I told Wanda, I said, I won't be here more than three years. Twelve years later, I was still their pastor, helping them get going. And now they're pastored by my assistant pastor and still going and, and doing some great things. Coincidence? I don't think so. And sometimes maybe we have ruled some things out as coincidence. The third piece of this is proving his will. You know what proving his will goes into? A passage that we love, don't we? Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and here's what, here's what it says. I therefore urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable or spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is and what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, there's several pieces of teaching here that he talks about here, and that is that God's going to give us a God-sized assignment. He's not trying to trickle some of this stuff to us. Are we willing to make that change in our life? And part of that change is that renewing of the mind. In the Greek, the renewing of the mind here means renovating the mind. It means completely changing for the better. And so God starts from the inside out. The world starts from the outside in. God starts working from the inside out and starts renewing and renovating and changing the way we think about some things. Let me hit something for our dads for just a moment. I read this just a couple of weeks ago and I thought about this. I read a statistic and dads, we've got more men in this church with their, with their wives and family than, than, than normal. We've got a higher percentage, and that is phenomenal. And part of that, I think, is because of the leadership of Adam and Jared. But I think part of it is, is that we've got families who are interested in coming to church. But dads need to do more than just go to church. I was backslid and went to church with Wanda. We need to be people that are leading our families. We need to be people who are making sure that we influence our families. Let me give you a statistic, and then I'll move on, okay? Because it's a great day for our dads, and we've got some wonderful, wonderful men in this church. I read this statistic, 59% of the children 
uh, will not go to church as adults if dad is not active when they are a child. Think about that statistic. 59% of the children will not go to church if dad didn't go to church when they were a child. Because guess what? They're going to be just like daddy and not go to church. I just thought that was an amazing thing. So what is God's will? Man, God's will is for our men to be discipled, our men to be able to walk with God, our men to be able to influence their kids. Let me tell you something. You're not perfect. You're not going to be perfect with your kids. And as you get to be an old geezer, you're going to look back and wish there's a lot of things you did differently. I've apologized to all my kids. <clears throat> I've apologized to them because there's a lot of stuff I wished I had done differently. And you know what? You're going to be just like that. And that's okay. That's okay. Because the end result is, is that your kids will be very forgiving to you, and you get the grandkids to be able to work on next. And that's a better part anyway. That's a lot better than, than, the, than the kids. But the point I'm getting at with this is that you're going to influence them, those kids one way or another. And so doing his will, Ephesians 6, 6, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from the heart. You see, if we go to church and we gripe and complain like I did years ago, you know what? It's eye service. We're there at church. We're going through it, but nothing, nothing's happening. We're not letting anybody get to us. We're not letting the Holy Spirit move in us. We're just showing up. Check mark here. Might as well call roll. Keith Math is here. But God wouldn't do anything in my life. And then once God started moving in my life, guess what? He moves and works on a movable target. How in the world can we get anywhere if we're not moving and he's trying to move us? Adrian Rogers made a statement one time and I wrote it down and I love it. He said, the Bible is the only book. He said, we read a lot of books, but the Bible is the only book that reads you. And that's what the difference is. This is a living, breathing book that reads us. Eye service. Eye service was the same term that they used for a master where people would work when the master would come by the slave. What happened? They'd get busy. Master's here. You know what? We need to be busy because our master is here. He's watching us. He's seeing us. Henry Blackaby, I know many of you in the church years ago, took the old course, uh, Experiencing God. Henry Blackaby's main statement in the beginning of that book, you remember this? Henry Blackaby said, find where God is at work and get in on it. You know what? That's not a bad philosophy. That's not a bad deal. Is it a coincidence or is it God? See, if we want to know God's will, we have to be different. The great old commentator, uh, John Henry uh, Jowitz, said, ministry that costs nothing, accomplishes nothing. So what's it costing you? Church isn't convenient. Ministry isn't convenient. It's not, that's not how it works. You know, people who are hurting don't always do it between 9 to 5 and when we got free time. People who are hurting are hurting at that moment. Is it a coincidence or God's direction? What do you think about some of those things in your life that you think that were just coincidence? Maybe God's trying to move and maybe we missed something. Now let me close with this. God's at work in your life whether you know it or not. You say, well, I'm backslid like you are. God's still working on you. You're... Let me tell you something, big boy. God's a lot bigger. He's a lot tougher than you. You say, well, you don't understand. I know I don't. I know y'all don't understand. I don't understand what happened in your life. I don't understand. And I don't understand what, what it is that's got you to the point where you're mad at God. Don't understand. I know it was in my life, and yours, yours is probably a lot worse, no doubt about it. But it's not a coincidence that God's trying to move in your life. Now let me close with this story. Many of you know who Billy Graham is. Billy Graham is young evangelist is preaching all over the place, but that's not the person I want to talk about. I want to talk about a song leader who led music for him for some 50 years, Cliff Barrows. Cliff Barrows got married in 1940s, and he and his wife get on a train to take their honeymoon. They're going to a hotel, to a city, and when they get there, the hotel has closed down. There's no place for them to spend their week of honeymoon. And so Cliff Barrows and his wife are looking around to see if there's a hotel, another hotel, not another hotel anyplace. And so a lady runs across them and finds out that they're needing help, and she has a grocery store. And so she says, well, it's not fancy, but I've got a, ha I've got a room above my store that you can stay in until we find something. So they are so thankful because it's a, it's a, it's a cold, cold night. They go up. They spend the night in the, above the store. And so during the next day, she finds a friend who has a house, and so they decide they're going to move the newlyweds over to the house to where they've got a week of privacy. And so she comes over to get them to move them to the house. Coincidence so far? No. 
As she gets there, she starts hearing Cliff, Cliff Barrows up in the room playing a trombone of all these Christian songs. So she begins talking to them about Christianity, and they find out that he's going to be a music minister. So she said, well, you know, we've got a young preacher who's going to be in town. His name is Billy Graham. I'd love for you to come to the, to the service tonight. He said, man, we'd love to. So she gets them over to their house so they're going to spend their week of honeymoon, gets them all settled. That night they get to the, church, to the church where Billy Graham is preaching, and he's a young man just starting off. So they're sitting there, and so they're getting ready to start the service, and the song leader that was supposed to be at that service didn't make it. The lady walks up and says, well, I don't know if he's a, how good a song leader he is, but I know he knows music. I heard him playing his trombone, Christian songs. Coincidence? And so they go and ask Cliff if he would lead music that night. And Cliff Barrows gets up and leads the music with Billy Graham. That was the last job interview for Cliff Barrows. He worked with Billy Graham all his life from that point on. Coincidence? Not at all. I want you to consider something for me, okay? I'm not your pastor. I'm just an old guy who's going to this church. I want you to consider something. What is God trying to do in your life? What is God wanting to do in your life? Is there something that maybe you have looked at that you have bypassed because you thought it was a coincidence, but God was really trying to make a move in your life and change you? I want you to at least be, consider a couple of things. When those so-called coincidences come, is God doing something? Or it could be a coincidence, I guess. But let me tell you something. God does a lot of crazy things through coincidences. And so all you've got to do is think back through your life, and you realize if this had not happened, this would not have happened, and so forth. And God does it over and over and over again. Coincidence? I don't think so. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, so much for the so-called coincidences in our life. Thank you, Lord, so much that we need to listen to you and look and see what are you doing to change and renovate our life. Father, I pray for the men in this church. I am so thankful to see them here every Sunday. I'm so thankful, Lord, to see the families that are represented here. And Lord, I'm thankful that we have a pastor who is leading our church and preaching to us Sunday after Sunday the Word of God. We never have to question his commitment. We never have to question his dedication. And Father, I just pray that you will just allow something from this to just touch our heart, to at least consider when that coincidence comes, is God trying to do something behind the scenes? In Christ's name we pray. Amen.